Welcome back. Uh, so, today I would be actually talking about uh, in continuation to my earlier lecture about silicon processing and uh, the various uh, non conventional techniques which are available for processing silicon particularly with the MEMS perspective. So, uh, let us just briefly review our previous lecture. Uh, in the last lecture we talked about and discussed some of the materials uh, which are used for MEMS. Uh, micro MEMS is microelectromechanical systems, and uh, uh, basically one of the primary materials for MEMS uh, uh, because the processing of MEMS actually is nothing but borrowed from the uh, microelectronic industry. Uh, therefore, MEMS is uh, uh, more suitable to processing with silicon. So, therefore, uh, we studied uh, some of the silicon manufacturing techniques using uh, the Zokralki's. Uh, growth method where a crucible maintained at an inert atmosphere was rotated and a seed crystal was lowered into the crucible for uh, getting a bowel and this bowel would be uh, a sort of directional growth of uh, the fused 99.99 uh, percent pure polycrystalline silicon which uh, would there be which would there uh, which would be there in that uh, in, in, uh, in the crucible. And, uh, you can basically do the post processing of this bowel to obtain wafers uh, with uh, good super finish on the surface as well as uh, you know various thicknesses etcetera. So, we also did some thermal modeling of the Zokralki's growth method wherein uh, we talked about uh, things like uh, one dimensional heat uh, transfer equation and try to uh, understand how much uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the heat uh, uh, flow would be from uh, the liquid side of the of the crucible to the uh, zone of fusion and from the zone of fusion to the solid and the net heat balance was equated to the way that mass is formulated uh, and in terms of its bonds of formation of the solid phase so we also obtained an optimum pull rate uh, based on uh, this modeling uh, and also try to optimize based on uh, you know indicators like point defects and thermal stress uh, related dislocations. And so, uh, then we actually refer to a different model of uh, silicon manufacturing using float zone method. Finally, talked about glass which is another very important material for MEMS and then we just uh, started with some MEMS fabrication strategies particularly the surface and bulk micro machining. Surface micro machining again being an additive process and uh, where where it can be deposited i mean the layers of layers of thin films can be deposited on the surface and bulk micro machining can be a subtractive process where you can remove material from the volume of uh, the particular wafer for doing machining now let's look at some of the alternate mems fabrication processes which are available and for doing that i would like to highlight this uh, this uh, etching, etching uh, uh, technique subtractive technique. So, what really etching? Etching is a uh, you know is referred to uh, wet etch, etch, etching can be dry as well as wet and uh, let us first see what wet etching is. So, wet etching is really a process uh, uh, where solid materials uh, can be immersed in a chemical solution and the solution can uh, displace atoms or molecules from the surface of this material uh, because of certain chemistry is in reaction. Okay. So, uh, when you talk about wet etching in microelectronics, mostly uh, etching processes are isotropic or homogeneous in nature, which means meaning thereby that uh, the etch rates would be independent of direction and it would be homogeneous in all the directions. And it would also be independent of the crystalline orientation. So, uh, let us say if you are trying to etch this surface uh, of silicon and you have made this etch protective layer on the surface which is uh, not amenable to the etching process or in other words it does not corrode or etch out if you are using a certain etchant. So, this can form a sacrificial mask on the top of the surface and it can expose the silicon material which is underneath it in this particular region. So, the etchant can go and eat away the material and it can go and start etching in all the directions homogeneously thus obtaining a, a hemispherical crater like this. What is also important is because there is a uh, rate of etch in the uh, 
lateral as well as the vertical direction. Lateral edge would actually let the silicon cut uh, to a size more than what it is intended to by the sacrificial mask. So, this process of extra cutting is also known as undercutting. So, uh, because of this under etching or undercutting effect, uh, isotropic etching has uh, drawbacks in designing lateral structures and therefore, you will have to always assume an etching allowance for uh, uh, this kind of uh, etching to take place. Uh, if the uh, solution is very well stirred, there is no accumulation of material coming off uh, from these surfaces and you can have this kind of a homogeneous profile. However, if you do not etch or if you do not stir the solution well, the atoms which come out from the surface are uh, not being able to dissolve properly in the etchant solution, thereby uh, creating a situation where because of this high density near one zone. Uh, there may be diffusional restrictions and the H and may not be able to etch in a particular manner. Whereas, uh, other uh, materials which are etched from let us say the sides may be having a greater etch rate resulting in a uh, directional etch rate. So, in this particular case the lateral etch is much faster than the vertical etch because of the accumulation of materials coming out of the material uh, of, of, of the silicon. So, that is what happens when the solution is not stirred. Okay. So, there uh, these paradigms are kind of used off and on for describing wet etching. What is also important is something called an etch selective layer. So, uh, for example, you saw this mask here, the mask does not get affected by the etchant itself, although whatever is underneath the mask gets affected. Okay. So, this is called an etch selective layer, which is not amenable to the particular etchant which is being used in this context. So, it is called the etch selective layer. Okay. So, if you look at a table of materials uh, which uh, are commonly used in MEMS or microelectronics fabrication, you have the silicon, silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, aluminum, these are some of the common materials. So, these etchant materials uh, can be for instance a combination of hydrofluoric acid, nitric oxide or nitric acid and uh, acetic acid or for example, uh, the etchant material can be a simple KOH solution or a combination of hydrofluoric acid and ammonia so on so forth. So, these uh, etchants are amenable to removing materials by etching action which are mentioned on the table on the left. But the table on the right, the column on the right is basically indicative of what these materials are selective to which means that if you are using this etchant solution of HF. HNO3 and CH3COH as you can see here, uh, it can etch SI or silicon or uh, and, and it can stop whenever it faces a layer of SiO2. So, that is what selective or selectivity of the etch process means, but how selective the etchant is uh, by in, in terms of its uh, stopping the etching action uh, is what selective 2 would mean. So, here uh, the bunch of materials on the extreme right column which actually indicates what are the selective layers for the particular material and etchant combination that we are actually looking at here. So, that is all about uh, sort of wet etching and uh, uh, the selectivity can also be uh, defined by, uh, the, by the way that the etching performs while meeting the selective layer. For example, there are two illustrations here case 1 and case 2 as uh, can be seen. Uh, in this particular example. So, here for example, the etch selective layer which is this yellow layer uh, between the green and the, the pink, uh, the, the etchant is not very selective. So, it has low etch selectivity. Thus, uh, even though there is a stopping yellow layer, the, the etchant goes and disturbs the green material and it crosses the etch selective layer. Uh, whereas, in, in case 2, it is a high etch selectivity. So, uh, we can see that the etchant is more or less homogenizing uh, the surface and it stops whenever it meets the etch selective layer. So, that is the advantage of etch selectivity. So, a high etch selectivity is definitely desirable for MEMS processes to maintain a control on the dimensions because the dimensions itself are very small as well. So, uh, let us now look at some of the common etchants for uh, isotropic wet etching and this we had actually mentioned before. Uh, 
So, you have uh, the material to be etched, the etchants which are used and what it is selective to and this table has been well described uh, before as well. So, just for the records these are very important for realizing some of the basic MEMS processes which uh, would uh, require uh, this kind of wet etching action on the top of silicon substrates. Etching can be wet or etching can be dry as uh, mentioned before. Dry etching is basically uh, a technique where uh, you use a certain uh, corroding uh, gaseous atmosphere to eat uh, away parts of the material which you are etching. So, therefore, uh, dry etching is again uh, uh, something which you know a gas phase causes a reaction with an atom or a molecule on a surface by absorbing onto a free site and then taking away or carrying away the atom or molecule uh, out of the surface. So, that is uh, what the dry etching processes are. If you look at the different dry etching processes, you have physical dry etching uh, is number one which utilizes uh, just beams uh, of ions, electrons or photons. Okay. And what we mean by that is that uh, essentially uh, these beams are high energy beams which would deliver energy and bombard uh, their own constituents uh, like ions or electrons or photons onto the surface and that would result in uh, the damage of the material surface. So, it would kick off the material uh, which is rather placed on the surface and well bonded. So, there is an exchange of kinetic energy of these ions and atoms come out from the substrate surface because of this kinetic energy delivered onto the substrate. The, the high beam energy uh, evaporates sometimes the knocked out material and we will actually study in great details uh, these uh, the mechanics of you know removal of material when we talk about uh, the electron beam machining or E beam machining. Some of the limitations that this process has that it has a slow etch rate and it is not very selective which means that it attacks everything that comes in its way and uh, it, it can actually damage the whole surface uh, very uh, uh, rapidly uh, because of which uh, there is nothing called an etch stop or an etch selective layer uh, which you can use for this physical dry etching. Another very interesting effect here is uh, basically the trench effects which is caused by reflected ions. So, this is illustrated here in this example that if you have uh, a pit of this nature and let us say you have a E beam which is coming and hitting onto the surface and uh, is trying to deliver some electrons. So, there is obviously uh, a deflection or bombardment of the electrons which would actually go and strike the surfaces like this okay. and the momentum is still not consumed properly and some of these electrons would bounce back. And so, they would actually create a rough surface which is also known as the trench effects by the reflected ions or reflected electrons. So, that is an obvious disadvantage of uh, physical dry etching. Uh, the other technique that we have is a chemical uh, dry etching where we are using a chemical vapor and uh, promulgating a reaction between the etchant gas that we are using uh, and the surface material. So, the etchant gas would chemically attack the material that you need to remove and uh, basically the gaseous products uh, are conditions for chemical dry etching because deposition of reaction products will stop the etching process. So, you have to be very very choosy about what gases you are using for uh, the chemical dry etching phenomena and chemical dry etching is actually highly isotropic in nature and it is similar to the wet etching because there is no edge selectivity whatsoever. The, the material the gas phase which comes and etches away the material uh, you know the, the substrate surface is really uh, not very well directed. It is like a vapor atmosphere which is attacking uh, a surface uh, into question and so therefore, uh, it is very homogeneous and very isotropic uh, in nature. So, that is about uh, dry etching. So, then there are other techniques uh, and before going ahead I would just like to illustrate some of the recipes of the dry etchant gases as you can see here. So, here you have let us say uh, and this is uh, as far as the chemical dry etching process goes. So, the materials again are all indicated on the very left column and then there are these etchant gases recipes like for example, boron tetrachloride and chlorine or boron tetrachloride and uh, carbon tetrafluoride or BCL 3 and CHF 3 all these different combinations of gases uh, 
are basically agents or they act as agents for the material silicon and then they are again selective to SiO2 because there is some degree of selectivity that you can use in chemical dry etching although uh, the process is not very well directed and it is very very isotropic in nature. So, these are some of these uh, the recipes which you can think of uh, while etching silicon or silicon dioxide or nitride or any other material of importance for the MEMS point of view uh, and uh, the, the column here shows what uh, these recipes are selective to meaning thereby that uh, a presence of this would act as an etch stop and the etch will stop because facing of such a surface. Another very interesting uh, example of etching is this physical chemical uh, etching which is actually a combination of chemical gaseous environment with some degree of uh, you know uh, mechanical or physical movement of the gases and this uh, comes into existence because of uh, a form of uh, or a state of matter called the plasma. So, as you all know plasmas are nothing but uh, made up of uh, ions and electrons with a certain level of density of these ions and electrons across the bulk of the material. Although the bulk is otherwise uncharged because you have equal number of positive and negative charges, but uh, then these exist as ions and they can be driven to a surface and they can be used for carrying uh, all these etchant gases or gaseous environment. So, if you can create a plasma and then create a chemical gas environment, then uh, the directionality of the etching can be very well maintained and some of these processes are very, very important from MEMS point of view. For example, reactive ion etching is a process where you create a plasma and uh, the plasma is semi uh, chemically reactive in nature. So, therefore, one aspect of the plasma is how the plasma comes and attacks uh, the surface and another aspect of the plasma is basically uh, there is a chemical reaction on the surface uh, which it attacks. So, therefore, the physical chemical etching referring to a plasma and uh, a chemical reaction both taking place together. There are some other examples of these physical chemical etching for example, anodic plasma etching magnetically enhanced reactive ion etching and we will do these different forms of plasmas in great details in a little bit later. Then the triode reactive ion etching and then transmission coupled plasma etching these are some of the processes which can be categorized as physical chemical etching processes. Let us now look at a very interesting uh, example of uh, the basic of how you can go small. And uh, whenever we talk about uh, carving or creating thin features and structures, almost always uh, the term which comes to our mind is uh, photolithography. So, what is lithography? Many of you may have earlier uh, done photography in your school days as a, as a hobby and in a photography what happens really is that you have a, a photo film and uh, this film is actually used to project whatever is there on the film using a beam of light onto a photo paper and then once the photo paper is exposed, uh, the areas which are exposed on the photo paper has a chemical reaction because of interaction with the photons and you can actually develop it or dissolve this portion in a chemical solvent and it results in creation of black and white pixels on the surface. So, that is what photo uh, photography typically is and especially in the olden days uh, when digital cameras were not there that was the only modality which was used for developing or printing of the photographs. Lithography is uh, an identical process only difference here is that it can be used at the micron scale and instead of uh, visible light sometimes we use ultraviolet radiation which is very very sensitive to resists and uh, the photo paper in a photography is replaced in a photolithography by something called a resist. So, let us see what is lithography in details. So, it is uh, definitely the most important uh, technique for fabricating microstructures and depending on uh, the, the energy of the beam lithography techniques are quite divided into photo lithography, electron beam lithography, x-ray lithography, ion lithography so on so forth. As is obvious if you use light waves for doing lithography it falls within the domain of photolithography. If uh, you increase the beam energy uh, 
uh, it falls within the domain of E beam lithography or X ray lithography and ion lithography. Ion lithography you can increase up to any extent by accelerating uh, the ion uh, using an external electric field. So, I would like to mention here that uh, uh, the, uh, the higher is the wavelength of uh, uh, a particular beam, lower is the beam energy and vice versa. So, a high energy beam is typically characteristic of a lower wavelength and uh, the low wavelength means that you can actually resolve at a better uh, sensitivity. And so, if you go high on the scale, you have better resolution of the system. So, as we all know, the very famous uh, equation of diffraction uh, of, of resolution theta, the angular resolution theta is actually expressed as lambda by d. Lambda, of course, is the wavelength of the incident radiation and d is uh, the distance of the object from the telescopic eye piece. So, basically uh, as you see here in this uh, example uh, or in this illustration, if the lambda goes down or the wavelength of light goes down meaning by thereby that the, the wave uh, concerned wave is a high energy wave, then obviously the angular resolution theta will also go down. Uh, which means that you can actually distinguish between two objects placed by a closer distance uh, more appropriately or better in a better manner. So, therefore, uh, the resolution really depends on uh, the wave energy and so if you keep on pumping up the wave energy the resolution thereby increases meaning that you can be able to distinguish two objects by writing them together uh, at a closer distance and be able to make independent objects out of them. So, the patterning uh, process with photolithography uh, is uh, really limited to uh, two dimensional structures and features. It is actually called a two and a half D process because uh, the thickness of the features are uh, defined by the spin speeds of uh, the resists that you spin on the surface. And uh, you can use the x y 2 D surface for doing the patterning uh, in whatsoever manner you want. Therefore, you can only resolve at a two dimensional level. So, this uh, technique uses a photo sensitive emulsion uh, layer called resist as I mentioned before. It transfers the desired pattern from the transparent mask uh, to the substrate. So, if you look at how photolithography is placed really, uh, there are three steps in which photolithography happens. One is the positioning uh, process where the lateral positioning of the mask and the substrate which is coated with the resist uh, is made adjusting the distance between the mask and the substrate. Then there is an exposure process where the optical or x-ray exposure of the resist layer is made thereby transferring the patterns from the mask surface to the resist layer and by changing the properties of those exposed areas. And then of course, there is the third step of development where whatever as just in photo photography whatever has been imprinted onto the top of the resist from the mask uh, can be removed by physically developing it into a etching solution and whatever parts are exposed are either removed or they keep there uh, thereby formulating micro size features or vias whatever is needed. So, if you look at photolithography in a step by step manner really it is uh, uh, illustrated here uh, as an example. So, you have a mask uh, surface as you can see here this is the mask okay, and uh, this mask is actually made more or less using the power of a cad or autocad uh, files and they are printed on uh, transparency or hard masks and then there is a light source uh, at the top here what you can see so the light falls onto the mask and uh, passes through the mask and thereby whatever uh, features on this mask are made for blocking the light would block those portions of the light and whatever features are open are open and light passes through them and falls on to the the, the wafer which is actually coated with the resist. So, wafer is coated with the photo resist and uh, thereby it creates the imprints onto the top of the wafer which you can develop and expo uh, you know you, which you can actually uh, develop later to formulate the features. So, for making masks you use uh, typically uh, an electron gun uh, 
and uh, you focus it using deflection coils, magnetic deflection coils and you can very finely scribe uh, a film of chromium, uh, a thick film of chromium made over a glass and this we call as hard mask. In case uh, the mask is soft, even that option is available or you can get a printed transparency mask where there is a uh, Kodak Mylar film which you can actually print at a high resolution of about 5000 dpi uh, dots per inch using a, a photo plotter and uh, the, the power of the CAD can again be used for printing uh, different features and structures on the soft mask and instead of using the hard mask uh, in a very complex uh, which is actually fabricated using a very complex uh, uh, you know e-beam or uh, and, and scribing onto the surface we use this soft mask which can actually uh, imprint uh, or, or serve the same for, for purpose. However, in case of a soft mask or a, or a polymer mask, uh, the, the main uh, difference or the main disadvantage is that you cannot go to a very high resolution because it is limited by uh, the way that dots are printed to formulate the images onto the transparency mask. So, typically these are the processes that would be used for photolithography. You start with a silicon substrate and clean the substrate properly. Sometimes uh, using uh, recipes like pirhana or even uh, AMD, acetone, methanol, DI water and then after doing the substrate cleaning, you basically spin coat the resist, the photo resist which is actually the polymer material which is photo exposable. Uh, thereby, you actually do a pre-bake where whatever solvent was used for spinning the resist uniformly on the top of the wafer is uh, evaporated thereby solidifying the, the resist film on the surface. And then after doing this pre-bake you do the exposure using the masking process of the photo resist so that whatever windows have been made in the mask are kind of printed onto the resist. And then with this printed uh, shapes you can do a post exposure bake where the resist is again uh, baked at a certain temperature so that uh, the, the heat is acting as a catalyst there. Uh, the photo exposure process typically is either a cross bonding or a debonding process and the bond initiation between the polymer matrix actually gets uh, either enhanced because of heat or uh, sometimes bonds, uh, bond breakage uh, becomes enhanced because of heat. So, heat is a catal catalyst which acts to fasten the reaction and the way that uh, the, the photoresist is uh, exp uh, the developed or uh, exposed. So, after doing this post exposure bake, uh, you do the development of the resist by using a solution uh, which is uh, actually uh, uh, something which takes away the resist uh, which is either exposed or unexposed depending on the type of the resist that we are using and then after developing you do another uh, step of bake here that whatever is remaining on uh, the surface of the wafer can get properly hardened and settled and also the developer can get removed from different uh, places of the wafer and thereby you get a uh, you know a certain feature or a set of features or patterns onto the surface of the resist uh, wafer and then you can do various things like you can etch uh, using those patterns or you can actually strip the photo resist later after depositing metal so on so forth. So, this is the whole complex process of photolithography. If you look at uh, the types of uh, lithography, well, there are typically three different types of lithography which, are, which, which exist and it really depends on the relative orientation of uh, the substrate with respect to the, the mask. Okay. So, there is uh, uh, there are three kinds as I mentioned one is contact lithography or contact printing where the mask and the substrates are in very close proximity almost touching each other. This proximity printing or proximity lithography where they are actually close but not that close because there is a layer of about uh, 20, 30 microns of air. Uh, which is a space in between the mask and the substrate and then we have projection lithography which is actually used in the industry uh, as proximity and contact are typically laboratory processes. For high yield processes there is always a disadvantage of resist coming in contact with the mask and going away. So, therefore, projection lithography is more or less used in the industry where you have a mask uh, at some distance from the wafer which is again spin coated with the resist 
and then expensive optics is used to guide the light so that the diffraction effects can be minim minimized and then whatever is projected from the mask passing from the mask is projected directly onto the resist film. So, in the first two techniques uh, again uh, the mask is brought close to the substrate as uh, I have just uh, indicated contact printing lets uh, the mask even touch the photoresist layer. The resolution B on such a case uh, depends on the wavelength lambda and the distance s uh, between the mask and the resist layer and B is expressed as 1.5 lambda times of s uh, to the power of half. Again lambda is the wavelength, s is the distance between the mask and the resist layer. So, I have a small problem uh, designed for you guys to solve. So, let us say you have a resist layer at the bottom of a 5 micron deep channel and a 20 micron deep channel. So, there are two different illustrations one the channel is 5 micron deep another uh, the channel is 20 micron deep and this is to be uh, patterned using uh, contact lithography and the photoresist is exposed to UV light uh, which is about 400 nanometers in wavelength and uh, we want to compare the resolutions B of uh, uh, you know the bottom of the two channels. So, in one case S therefore, equals uh, 5 microns and the bottom of uh, this deep channel and uh, let us call it S 1 and in the other case S 2 uh, you know the, the distance at which lithography has to happen is about 20 microns assuming that uh, the contact of the mask is actually at the top of the channel and the channel is below the mask. Okay. So, that is what we are assuming here. So, therefore, you will have uh, the resolutions B 1 and B 2 uh, as uh, basically uh, S 1 uh, by S 2 to the power of half from equation 1 here okay. and uh, therefore, uh, this really is 1 fourth to the power of half or half. So, therefore, the resolution in a <coughs> case of uh, the 5 micron channel is uh, exactly half the resolution uh, in case of the 20 micron channel which is illustrated here. So, therefore, uh, as you are seeing here the resolution B 1 in the case of the 5 micron deep channel is better in terms of resolution distances. right? So, B 1 is half the distance of resolution of uh, the 20 micron channel meaning thereby that deeper the channel the blurrier will be the images therefore, the resolution uh, would accordingly change. So, shallower on uh, the channels or uh, lesser the channel depths the uh, the distance by which you can resolve two objects is lesser in comparison to if the channels are deeper. So, that is what uh, is contact lithography typically uh, you can have uh, the uh, you know projection lithography resolution equation expressed in a little different manner it is given by this uh, lambda s by 2 n a where lambda again is uh, the wavelength s again is the distance of the object from uh, uh, the, the masking layer and then n a is basically the numerical aperture of the imaging lens system. Mind you in uh, projection lithography you have to use expensive uh, uh, you know optics for guiding the light so, uh, so that there is no diffraction effect. Uh, because it comes through typically very long distances from small windows. So, therefore, a uh, uh, projection lithography system uh, would have a resolution B expressed by lambda s pi twice the numerical aperture of such a system. So, <coughs> typically there are two different kind of resists which exist and uh, this uh, particular illustration here kind of shows what would be the role of uh, the two different kind of resists. So, one is a positive tone resist and another is a negative tone resist. So, in a positive tone case as you see here you start with the silicon wafer and then you spin coat uh, let us say a small layer of adhesion promoter which sometimes uh, sticks the resist on to the surface of the particular wafer and then you spin coat a photoresist layer which is represented by this yellow uh, color here and then you selectively expose the photoresist by this masking strategy. So, that you can have patterning of uh, the resist in this particular manner and so you develop away the unbonded portions. And so, in one case which is the positive resist actually the, the resist which is exposed gets debonded and it goes away. So, a positive resist is signified by uh, 
making vias or trenches. So, uh, that is what the, the positive side of the resist is. The negative resist is on the other hand uh, a resist where wherever you are exposing you basically cross bonding. So, therefore, it goes through the same cycles as you are seeing on the right side here. Uh, there is a adhesion promoter, there is a photoresist layer, there is a masking strategy which you have made and then finally, you are exposing selectively these portions and wherever it gets exposed the resist stays back because it gets kind of cross bonded and so you can develop away the remaining areas okay and so basically the features and structures are ones which are exposed so it's a completely different form of uh, you know uh, lithography the masking would be different everything else would be different this is su8 uh, is not as 1813 so therefore you know with these two types of resists in one case you can actually get uh, features and structures like vias inside the resist that means wherever it is exposed it uh, goes off on development and on the other you have uh, structures and features and micro features actually itself where there is cross bonding and wherever it is exposed it stays back the remaining portions go away. So, a combination of both these uh, resists would play a major role in building up micro systems as we will see in future uh, lectures to come. So, that is uh, about photolithography. Now, let us look at a little uh, uh, you know uh, different uh, field of uh, MEMS which is also called polymer MEMS. So, as we know that increasingly uh, because of the application of MEMS to the biological side uh, for bio remediation, diagnostics, uh, clinical detection, uh, polymers become very amenable materials because they are friendly as such with uh, the biological systems. And uh, therefore, uh, there is a huge initiative in the area of polymer MEMS which automatically comes in uh, because of this uh, merger between the biological world and the micro systems engineering. <coughs> so, what is polymer MEMS? A polymer MEMS is of course, the application of polymers to build micro features and structures and uh, uh, this is uh, basically owing to the friendly nature of organic surfaces and interfaces to biological entities as they can identify uh, most of the biological entities themselves are organic in nature. So, they can identify each other very well and so they are very, very friendly with each other. So, their behavior could be uh, absolutely normal if uh, they meet surfaces or systems made up of polymers rather than inorganic materials. So, if you look at uh, some of the materials uh, and their properties uh, particularly uh, talking about polymers. So, in addition to silicon uh, you know whatever polymers you are using must have uh, this property of biocompatibility it should be ideal for biomedical devices. Uh, the polymer should be transparent within the visible spectrum, it should be rapidly uh, you know fabricated. So, uh, the fabrication strategy should be very rapidly be able to develop, it should be photo definable which means that you can actually expose it and uh, based on that you can define the features and structures in a manner and then it can be chemically uh, modifiable. So, these are some of the desirable properties that would be in polymer MEMS you know that it has biocompatible, it is optically transparent, it has uh, properties of rapid fabrication, it has photo definability okay, and then chemical modifiability. And uh, if you look at some of the choices that uh, the polymeric systems offer with uh, one or more of the properties indicated here, there are polydimethyl siloxane of course, it is one of the very fundamental um, uh, you know materials used in the, the biomems domain. Then you have hydrogels, uh, hydrogels are <coughs> Uh, very highly cross linked network of polymers which has uh, uh, you know the capacity of absorption of water or some other uh, you know specific pH materials and expand to almost 4 or 5 times its own volume. So, that is how hydrogels are very very important. Uh, PMMA which is an E beam resist again polymethyl methacrylate is a very very useful MEMS material for purpose of uh, micro nano work. And then of course, Teflon uh, which is uh, again highly hydrophobic in nature with a contact angle of around 120 degrees or so in the room temperature at room temperature. And then of course, some of the polymers like SU8, S1813 these are the classes of polymers known as resists. So, all these are some of the choices that polymers have to offer uh, 
for uh, with with one or more of the properties that have been indicated here and uh, to exemplify a few uh, polymers used in as on date available commercial mems platform uh, you can look at this chip uh, this immuno chip from aclara technologies or as a matter of fact this labon chip from caliper uh, systems which are actually commercially available and they are totally made with uh, optically transparent photo definable polymer material uh, and they find great use and great novelty for many bio biological diagnostics and uh, detection uh, modalities. <coughs> so, let us look at now some of the fabrication strategies and methods which can be used with polymers and we really classify these polymers as soft materials by virtue of their properties you know it is uh, uh, they, they have uh, a sort of softness you know uh, in terms of strength uh, uh, when you consider these polymers. So, that is why they are called as soft materials and the soft material domain also includes biological materials apart from polymers and uh, all these fabrication is uh, has really started from white sides group which uh, uh, can be called the sort of founder of uh, how to fabricate some of the polymer MEMS and uh, the, the domain of uh, process <laughs> which is used mostly for the, the fabrication of the soft material is also known as soft lithography just because you are using soft polymers and uh, you have to use uh, one step of lithography which can be then uh, used uh, you know the mold that you eventually create can be used many times to have um, you know the soft material uh, again and again molded across that mold. So, you have one step lithography followed by soft material driven micro molding which would result in features and structures at the micro scale uh, and uh, you can prototype it very very rapidly as well. So, some of the soft lithography techniques of course, replication and molding is a is a major technique uh, again developed at uh, white sides laboratory uh, micro contact printing again micro molding in capillaries micro transfer molding solvent assisted molding micro molding and then these two processes dip and lithography and uh, compression molding which includes hot embossing or injection molding and inkjet printing these are some of the methods which can be classified under the domain of uh, polymer mems okay so soft lithography is uh, is a class of processes compression molding is another class of processes and then inkjet printing is the third class of processes. These are some examples of what can be done with polymer MEMS. For example, this is an illustration of how PDM is doped with a Fe203 particle can be used uh, to make this high aspect ratio structures. So, these structures must be about close to uh, 20, 30 microns high and maybe about 2 microns in diameter and these can be used as tentacles just because they have Fe203 there is a tendency of an external magnetic field to move them and they can be used for peddling uh, action which can move forward the organism which would have or possess these tentacles. So, similarly this is a an interesting example of what soft lithography can do. You can see this uh, this replication of uh, a natural surface using polydimethyl siloxane and uh, very high aspect ratio replication is possible because of the unique property of this uh, polymer which is actually liquid at room temperature, but it cross links and cross bonds once you heat it at a certain temperature. So, let us look into some of the details of these processes. So, the first process which comes to our mind is replication and molding process which is actually illustrated in the schematic towards your right here. So, what happens is that you create a master uh, mold which is made up of silicon glass metal or SU8 resist using lithography you can create this mold and this mold has a sort of negative <coughs> impression of whatever you would like to realize on uh, the, the surface at micro features and micro structures. So, the mask is exactly the opposite inverted or negative of what features you are wanting to obtain. So, once this mold is uh, prepared the mold is basically uh, coated with uh, the some surface treatment is done. Uh, with um, uh, some uh, uh, layer of HMDS or some hydrophilic uh, hydrophobic uh, material and after this coating uh, is, is over uh, basically after this treatment of 
you know putting a mold release agent is over. So, this is a mold release agent that we are talking about. You pour a PDMS which is actually available as a liquid form and it is a mixture of uh, uh, silicon matrix and a curing agent and you mix it in a proper ratio of 10 is to 1 or 5 is to 1 uh, by volume. And uh, the curing agent basically ensures the cross bonding between the silicone rubber uh, on of the material. So, once you pour this uh, polymer on the top of this mold which already has been coated by a mold release agent, you heat cure this uh, PDMS for about 60 degrees and about 1 hour. So, that it gets finely cross bonded, the, uh, the cross bonding reaction is again heat catalyzed. So, if you put it in the normal ambient uh, room temperature, it can still get cross link, but it would take a huge amount of time. So, in order to accelerate the process, you have to actually heat cure it. Apply heat is uh, an equivalent of applying uh, catalyst and so it gets into a rubbery form. And then because the mold release agent is already there on the mold, the rubbery form can be withdrawn from the mold without any much uh, problems and then you can have the exact negative of the features which were there in the mold imprinted onto this PDMS. So, it is like a rubber stamp that you are making in this process. And then you have to be little careful because PDMS is a soft material. So, there are issues of aspect ratios where length and width can be very very critical which you have to. So, if it is a high aspect ratio then there may be a tendency of these features to kind of stick to each other as you remove them from the mold. If it is a low aspect ratio that means the uh, you know the, the, the height is much lesser in comparison to the width. There is a problem of the PDMS sagging down by its weight and then closure of the feature or structure can be achieved this way. So, therefore, you will have to be uh, careful about these two phenomena pairing and sagging uh, because of the soft nature of the PDMS material. But again it is a very useful process where you can actually make a you know a, uh, a replica which can be uh, having structures and features of the size range of about tens of microns onto the surface and you can use it as a stamp, you can uh, do a variety of other processes uh, based on that and it is one of the one of the fundamental processes in soft lithography, this replication and molding technique. It is very, very easily doable in any laboratory with just a little bit of infrastructure.